so honored to be with you, Dr. Bendapudi, because I've told you many times when you first landed in Kentucky what uh, a fangirl I am of you, even before you landed here, and you made such an impression just your first few months and the tenure that you've had so far. So I want to give you a few moments to talk about your background, how you became so successful, what you did before you got into academia, and maybe some advice, and then we'll just have a little grill chat. Okay, I, oh, well, I'm happy to do that. Hello, everybody. I, you know, I'm so glad Kirsten asked if this was the first time. I've been in many events, but this is the largest event I've attended so far post-pandemic, and it feels wonderful. Uh, I am the oldest of three daughters. She said to go away back, so just sit down. <laughs> but I mentioned that because I'm the oldest of three daughters. I've gone to all girls' schools, all the way, including college, and there's something about being in the company of powerful women, and each of us is powerful, whether we realize it or not, and we'll talk about that hopefully, makes me extremely happy. I also want to especially thank a few brave men who showed up today, because, can you give them a round of applause? We need you. We need you to support us. We need you to uplift us. We need you to talk about how important it is to have uh, leadership uh, of all races, all genders at the top. Today, we're going to be focusing on women in leadership. So I want to acknowledge two women that came with me today, my provost, Dr. Lori Gonzalez, and the head of our government relations at UFL, uh, Shannon Rickett. So I like to travel in the company of powerful women, as you can tell. Uh, so anyway, I grew up in India. I like to tell people I'm from the South. But I'm from the real South, the deep South, because I come from South India. And uh, I came to the United States as a graduate student. Um, Renee, I think I told you this, but when I was about five years old, apparently my family fell on very hard times. And when you're a child, you, what you know is what you know, you don't realize. But the entire extended family had pitched in for one person to go to the United States to study, and that was my father. And he went to the University of Kansas. So my mom stayed home with three little girls, five and under. No phone calls, no travel back and forth, and it's extraordinary. She's a hero, because for four years to manage, and he came back. And uh, so I didn't come with him as a child, was what I was trying to say. I mentioned that to you, because many people look at my bio and say, from India to Kansas, how did you do that? Did you throw darts at the map of the United States? So the truth is more prosaic, so that's for all of you. That's what I wanted to share. And I've always wanted to be in education. It's something that's a big passion of mine because it transforms lives. And I'm living proof of that. And I have seen how it changes lives for the individual and for the community. So I moved away from academia for a while, as you know. I was executive vice president of a bank that was a top 25 US bank. We had about 55 billion in assets, about 12,000 associates, and I enjoyed that. Uh, being in the C-suite and making a difference, but I realized after a few years of that, that my passion was still education. So that's why I went back to academia. Can I tell you something about my red outfit? Yes, please do. Okay. All right, this is for, for you all. I know you can keep it a secret. So the first week that I was on campus and made president, I thought, obviously for my inauguration, I wore red, and I said, I want to show that I'm proud of this university and that I'm proud to be the president. And then what happened was, someone came up to me that week after a second day and third day, and they said, we love it that you only wear red. <laughs> and this is a caution to you all. For two whole years, I wore nothing but red. <laughs> and I tried to think about, I could have simply said, oh, it's just for this week. But so now you might see me in something not red, except in a public event. So since we are sharing, I thought I would share with you what happens. But maybe not wildcat 
cobalt blue, right? No, yeah. can't That's do that. Off. That's off the list. Yes. <laughs> Um, you know, I have followed you and you have been on my programs and we've talked about all kinds of things. And today we're not talking about politics. Today we're talking about you. And you mentioned because you did have a very successful career in the banking institution, financial institutions, and wanted to get back to academia. Did you set your sights on becoming a president? And when did you know that's where I want to be? Uh, so all along, this is interesting. I did not think I wanted to be an administrator. In academe, we're kind of snooty about that. We're like, you've gone over to the dark side if you've become an administrator. I'm serious. My husband will still say, I didn't marry her when she was president. Like, you know, as though it's a horrible thing to be associated with an administrator. But what happened was, when I came back from Huntington Bank, something I had always realized, is that in academe, we talk a good game. If you, all of you, I bet if you're not in academe, you sit back and you think, oh, those bastions of liberalism and all those snowflakes. And it's the truth. The truth is that we handle diversity much worse than any business I know. I'm very proud of my background in business. It's beyond Huntington Bank. I talk about the nobility of business, but this is true. So one example for women would be, uh, so when I came back, I thought, I really do want to be part of the solution. Mm -hmm. I need to be in leadership to do that. And with the University of Kansas, my alma mater, I can talk about them, and I will talk about UFL. And uh, I did wear blue because I appeared on a program with Eli, uh -huh. and in his honor, I wore blue, and I'm still waiting for him to wear red, uh -huh. just so you know. We're gonna hold him to that. Yes, but my point is this cuts across universities. So I went back to the University of Kansas to be dean there because my professors reached out. They were in a difficult time, and I like doing you know, work of bringing people together. That year, Renee, a woman was made a full professor at the College of Business there. So there's three rungs, assistant, associate, full. Okay, so just so you know. The last time a woman had been made a full professor at the College of Business was 27 years before. That's not unusual in universities. So university presidents, overall there are 30% of the colleges and universities. And you think that's great but that's a lot of community colleges and two and four year colleges. When you get to degree, PhD granting universities, right, so the ones that give PhDs, it becomes 8%. Mm. And when you get to R1 universities, the highest level of research, like UFL is, it gets into the single digits. And if you think of women of color, sure. I, I actually know them all, personally. <laughs> There's like two others, so my point is, right. uh, so I decided I would be part of the change, and I love it. People say, I don't like it, or yeah, I told you in academia, you're, you're supposed to say you don't enjoy it. I loved being dean, loved being provost, and I love being president at my university, because it's a special place, and Anyway, that's, that's what I wanted to share. Yes, and as a woman of color, right, oftentimes getting to the ascension, to the pinnacle, to the peak, to the summit, you are in single-digit territory. And Without you question. Know all of your colleagues who, who are surrounding you. I'm curious about the reception when you came to the University of Louisville. You were very well received, and Absolutely. you were very bold, because sometimes, particularly as women of color, you feel you should be a shrinking violet to make yourself small, to feel like you're assimilating, to gain partners and friends. But you took a very bold approach, and you made some very tough decisions coming out of the gate, you stood by them, and diversity and inclusion and access have always been the hallmarks of your tenure when you first landed here in Kentucky. That is indisputable. And when you have somebody like a Ricky Jones with the University of Louisville who sings your praises at times, that's saying something. Well, with, all, with everybody, the at times is important, okay? Remember this. <laughs> so, at times. Uh, you cannot, you cannot um, do anything for one person or one group because uh, the choices you make and the decisions you make, each of us has to make them as a leader with the best interest of the institution at heart. So I have to tell you that I was very transparent about who I would be. And I see Diane Medley back there. 
I see Alice Houston, others who will tell you that I'm a lot of things, but shrinking violet doesn't really work for me. <laughs> uh, I will tell you that the board knew who they were getting. And I was very candid during my interview about who I was, what I would do. And I want you to know, my board, to a person, wanted that. Mm -hmm. And the reception could not have been warmer. I love it. And it is risky. A uh, couple of things. I'm a teacher at heart, so there are some ideas I want you all to remember. We may not have time to talk about it today, but would you do me a favor and write down the words glass cliff and look it up afterwards. So for women in leadership, uh -huh. how many of you heard about the glass ceiling? Raise your hands. All right, very good. So the glass cliff, just I'll give you a very quick overview, is the notion that in any industry, a non-normative leader is picked. So I like to talk about non-normative, that's all. It's not a minority, it's this, it's that. Norm is who is the typical. So the typical university president is a graybeard, right? You know, and they're typically white. That's, that's how they would describe it. So a non-normative leader is someone who doesn't fit the norm. The glass cliff idea is that whether if it's the sole male in an industry where everybody else is a woman leader, it doesn't matter. Non-normative leaders get to be picked, tend to be picked when the challenges are enormously difficult, okay? So when everything is going great, people tend to go with the normative leader. So you could give two interpretations. Either we've tried everybody else, we need a woman now to come uh -huh. clean it up, right? Or things are so bad, Surely a woman can't screw it up any worse. <laughs> you know, I don't know. But that's actually a phenomenon to study. And I bring that up to all of you because it does non-normative leaders a disservice. Because if they are taking on more challenging roles, then we look back and say they're not as successful right. that it actually is not level playing fields that you're comparing. Does that make it sense? It makes a lot of sense. And you came at a time where there were lots of challenges and that only a woman like you could sweep up and clean up, right? Well, it's a team, always. Right. One of the things you all know, it's those, the lone ranger, you know, that's just a fiction. You cannot do anything on your own, it's all about your team. And you are the face of the university, and I, I've always been aware of that, but I think having the right team around. So to me, I knew that you, the tenor you set. Culture is what you tolerate, is something I say all the time. It's not what you say, it's what you do. So you need to live consistent with that. So when people ask you, how do you lead as a woman? What do you say? And are you offended by that question? Um, it's like Ashley said. There are some questions that we are asked that are different. I've never shied away from it because you bring your whole self to work. And I try to do that for people. But I too remember, Ashley, being asked if I could be dean. Was I too nice to be a dean? You know, that kind of thing. And I just smiled. I wish I knew, bless your heart, then. <laughs> that was in Kansas. I really wish I knew it then. But I just said, oh, it's, you're so nice to think that, or something right. like that. That's similar. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> That'll work. But it's not as effective. Right. But anyway. So to me, I want to know, and it's taken time. Uh, you know, now I'm a little more confident in myself than when I obviously, uh, when I, younger I used to worry about it. Like am I being tapped for things because I'm a woman? Right. Or do people think I'm somewhere because I'm a woman? Uh, every board I was on until this year was all men and I was always the color in the room. Yeah. And so you worry about things like that and then I realized it's not about me. Right. It's about making change. That's right. Did you ever suffer from imposter syndrome? 100% and I still do. Uh, so how do you brace yourself to say, to come with full-throated confidence? So there are two things that are impo important. The imposter syndrome, it helped me to learn men suffer from it just as much. So the first time I realized that was my mentor, a very accomplished, older white male that we were, we still are, very close, and I talked about 
had been invited to give this keynote or something. This was a few years ago. And I said, you know, sometimes I get really scared. And he said, that's called the imposter syndrome. I suffer from it too, and gave me something to read about that. Mm -hmm. So it was a little reassuring that it wasn't just me, everybody goes through that. Equally bad for women is the stereotype threat. Like, you know, when you yes. asked, that was a great question, I mean, the great thing that you're saying. Yeah. Are we acting differently because we worry that people will say, oh, that's because she's a woman. Mm -hmm. I forget the name of the woman who won the world poker, Amy something. You know, she's really a world, po world series of poker or something. She won a $2 million purse and she said, I heard an interview with her and she says, for a long time she was holding herself back in terms of the moves she made because if she folded, she thought people will say, oh, she's playing like a girl. So sometimes we hold ourselves back on how people might judge us, so. Yes, and the stereotype threat is real and that perhaps we do shrink back and may not get our optimal potential, reach our optimal success because we are afraid of how we'll be perceived. And being the only one in the room, yes. I've, I've had that experience a few times. I bet it's you. nice not to have that experience today, but it, particularly as a woman of color, and we're in some very tense times when we talk about um, women of color, and I know that black women want to be called black women, not women of color. I've exactly. heard, heard all of these things. And so we're, we're dealing with some very sensitive issues when it comes to womanism, feminism, racism, all the isms are just colliding right now. And when you think about what you can do, not just for you, Abel, but for a community that has been hurting and is still hurting, uh, the leadership that you bring to, at this pivotal time, and even as an example for this state, um, do you believe that you were sent here at this time, it's like all aligned in the stars, for you to be at this very pivotal place at this critical time? I feel blessed to be here. And so I don't know, but I will give it my all. All I can tell you is every single day, I will give it my all. And that's the only way to be. I admire you, Renee, because I have seen you tackle some of these conversations, and I watch you, and none of us can tell what's going on. You are such a professional in listening to different points of view. But she's raised a very important point I'd like to take a moment and talk about. That's the burden of being the only. It is a burden, and the, the burdens go many ways, right? If you fail, you're afraid that people will say, if they said, oh, that Neely Bendapuri did a bad job, that's bad enough, that's one level of pressure. But if people say, we tried a woman, she didn't succeed, you feel that obligation that you gotta be. So the danger of that is that you will play not to fail rather than to succeed. You're so afraid of making mistakes, so you've got to break out of that. Uh, find allies, groups like this, Ashley, thank you, this is really important because I told you that when I was a professor at Texas A&M or Ohio State or in these roles, there were no other women peers in my institution necessarily, but finding other women who will share the stories with you, advice with you is hugely valuable. And a big kudos to Ashley as the president. Absolutely. You know, one of the youngest, or is the the youngest, the youngest president and CEO of the Chamber of Commerce across this nation. And what she's done with this summit today, uh, just kudos to doing that. And the work that she's doing and leading on racial equity uh, and inclusion is to be applauded. So, so back to being the only one in the room and the, the fear of failure, is there a fear of success? Do you carry that burden as well? with you? Uh, that's an interesting point, and it's very true, right? It goes with the imposter syndrome mm -hmm. in some ways, that if you're being tapped for something, and I think I'm battle-scarred enough now that it's much less, it, the, the liberation from all of that is when you realize, and it's not easy and I haven't accomplished it, you get it in flashes and moments, is it's really not about you. Right. It's about the institution. Right. The only reason, to want higher leadership positions is to expand the number of people you serve, right? You don't deserve to lead if you're not prepared to serve. And so 
that helps mm -hmm. because otherwise some days it's easy to say, why on earth am I doing this? Because whatever you do will be under the microscope. Someone or the other will not like it. But what I love about being at the helm of a university now, and I'm so delighted Susan Donovan, the president of Bellarmine is here, is that in society right now, my personal belief is we're all fighting, but we are talking past each other. We are really not listening to each other. We are not defining the same terms. And so universities have an opportunity to be a place where we can hopefully sit down and have productive discourse. That's the hope. So I want to ask you about not just leadership style, but decision making. Um, and you don't have to really convey the direct instance, but was there ever time that you made a judgment call that was wrong, that you thought, okay, that was the wrong move? How did you rebound, and what lessons did you learn from it, and how would you communicate, particularly to the young college students who are with us today, who are concerned about their confidence and who deal with imposter syndrome at a deeper level, perhaps, than you do perhaps now, you know, what would you say about not being afraid to go with your gut? If it turns out right, good. If it turns out not so good, that's also okay. I'm assuming we're not talking about hairstyle choices here. <laughs> uh, of course, uh, one of the things, and I, you, you raise a very good point. With my students, I used to always tell them, don't be afraid to make a mistake because it's not the first one in your life. And God willing, it won't be the last one, right? You are going to learn through the mistakes you make. But you've got to make sure you're making them from your values, that you consider all the information, and all you can do is make your best judgment. So things I've learned, that's much easier to address. Thank you for asking me that. For young people, since you said that, that's my soft spot in my heart. Number one, when you go to a new organization or a new group, do not form premature alliances. So I'm going to keep it super career focused unless you want me to do something else. Let's talk about different levels. This is true for everybody. When you go into a new group, you don't know enough. Learn before you take on, and office politics are bad. And so you want to be careful that early on that you're learning more before you make your judgment. A second thing is, if you are new to your job, I met someone who's taken on a new role. You know, the whole first 100 days, you go around and talk to people. That's a great idea. Don't promise anything at that point. I've done this too, because you go in, you're talking to different people, and everyone tells you, as the new person, we want you to do this and this and this. It's important that you say, I'm listening, I'm taking notes, but I'm not committing to anything. You know, because people might misunderstand and you take your listening to them as, sure, I'll do it. There's no way in your first 100 days you can act upon everything everyone has told you. And my last piece of advice is learning that I should not make a decision entirely on my own. So I'm really trying, I think I'm decent at it, but I work on whose voice is not at this table when I'm making a decision. So in your own interest, make sure you're listening to different points of view. We often don't notice who's absent in the room unless we're the one who's absent in the room. That's right. Right? I I've noticed that, with, yep. particularly when we have diversity inclusion conversations with folks who are not of color, and then there's only one person of color there. And I'm thinking, well, if we're really about this life, let's be about it and have those folks represented. And, and, and making sure, one of the things I loved about what you did when you first arrived at UofL is you gave students your cell phone number, your personal cell phone number. And you connected with students on a very personal level and made those connections. Building that community is really also a part of your legacy. And so I'm curious for you to talk about accessibility and how you balance that between being too overly accessible, uh, too overly perceived that you're being nur too nurturing or motherly. Uh, how, how do you balance that? And, and that's a great, back to those stereotypes we talked about, you know, men and women and what do, you, what do people think about. So th I do do that. I started it in Kansas. As dean, I would give my personal cell phone number to the entire student body there. 
Then as provost, I gave it to the entire university. And when I came here, I did that to every freshman class. That's usually how I start. And the reason for that, and no one has ever made a prank call, <laughs> ever. And I'm so proud of my students for that. They don't know me. Right. Um, I do do that because to me it was about not everyone has someone they can call. Right. Really, they don't. Think about the financial capital and the social capital. There was also another ulterior motive. The students were only, they, they never call, by the way, they only text. So that's even better. Right. But my point is, if they reach out to me, I cannot be their first stop. They have to exhaust every resource. So for some unit, if somebody is calling me to complain about a unit, that unit head knows that there's something wrong that the student is reaching out to me. Does that make sense? So I started it in Huntington Bank also because I was the chief customer officer responsible for the customer service provided by 12,000 of my associates. If I give customers my number, nobody wanted them to reach out to me. Right. <laughs> Very good. So in the time we have remaining, and it always goes by so fast, I do want you to think about your teenage self, the teenage Neely, knowing that your father was making tremendous sacrifice and that you would indeed maybe even follow in his footsteps, that academia is in your DNA. If you could write a letter to the teenage Neely, what would it say? Um, My life as a teenager would have been, well, actually, my life would have been very different based on who I married. Uh, I will tell you that growing up in South India, in my country, because I was, yeah, I was technically barely over my teens when I got married, okay? Uh, so I will tell you that that would have had a big impact. I would have had no control over it. Remember the time and place where I was growing up. Um, I grew up a lot, and I did not think I would come to the United States. This, this was, none of it was uh, something I thought about. But I do know I would have told my teenage self to discount more of what I heard around me, meaning that where I was growing up, I told you I'm the oldest of three daughters. People in my language would routinely say, you know, with children, you're trying to correct them, if not to tell lies, not to steal, all the good things we teach them. But in my language, we used to say, don't tell a lie or you will have daughters. <laughs> it's, it's really that, the saying. And we would say to someone who only had daughters, my mom, would, I would hear her being told this again and again. Don't be sad, you only have daughters. Who knows what you did in your previous life? Remember, we have karma. Mm -hmm. And so that they would, that's the sort of stuff they would say. So I would tell my teenage self to discount that more because I did feel uh, that somehow sorry for my mom that there weren't sons in the family, but it also gave me a chip on my shoulder that I would prove the others wrong, so maybe yeah. that wasn't so bad. Um, I think I would tell myself to dream big, not to be afraid. Uh, because that did not come to me till much later in life. Right. Would teenage Neely be proud of Dr. Bendapudi? I think teenage Neely used to be super judgmental about everything, <laughs> so I hope so. <laughs> like, uh, I hope so. Okay. Truly thought she knew everything, like any teenager, <laughs> so I hope so. Perfect fashion. The best advice that you have been given that you would lend to this crowd today, particularly oh to the young people who are in the room? For the young people in the room, and actually even for all of us, I think, but certainly for the young people in the room, don't worry so much about what other people are thinking about you. Because the truth is, no one really thinks about you as much as you think they do. They're really busy thinking about what you are thinking of them. <laughs> and so I think that's the biggest advice, uh, not, to be, not to make your judgments based on that. Yes, and the community of, of having a higher ed leaders, uh, three women in Louisville, I mean, that's magnificent. It is, and Tori Mc Martin McClure, who's yes. not here, my gosh, if you wanna talk about a hero, someone you look up to, 
Yeah, she's always asking me if I want to go on a skiing or walking right. with her. <laughs> and I'm like, sure, Tori, yes. sure. Yes, uh, Pearl in the, in the Storm, I think, is her book. She's and there's a musical about it now, too. Oh, wonderful. She is remarkable as She's well. She's remarkable as well. Well, we thank you. I look at me, so arrogant. I meant as well, not about me, but about Susan, <laughs> when I said she is remarkable as well. Yeah. Absolutely. Well, it's wonderful to have you here, for you to take time of your busy schedule, to appear in all of your glamorous red and all of the things that you're doing for this great Commonwealth. I hope all these women will recognize you and applaud you for the work you're doing. Dr. Neely Bentapudi. Thank you so much.